Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com, and in this video, I want to be going over acute respiratory distress syndrome, also called ARDS. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the respiratory system. And as always, at the end of this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. ARDS is a type of respiratory failure that occurs when the capillary membrane that surrounds the alveoli sac starts to leak leak fluid. And whenever it leaks fluid, fluid will actually enter into the sac. Well, we know that's a problem because why? Well, let's review our anatomy and physiology of our lungs a little bit. So what part in, of the lungs is really that functional unit? It's the alveoli sacs. This is where gas exchange occurs. So if we took a sac and we blew one up and we looked at it up close, this is sort of similar to what it would look like. Okay, so here on the sac, overlaying those sacs are like capillaries, and those capillaries are bringing blood from the heart because all the blood goes to the heart, must pass through the lungs to get oxygenated. So you have blood coming from the pulmonary artery, and the blood coming from the pulmonary artery is like the used up blood that the body has just used. It came back to the heart to get reoxygenated and to rid itself of carbon dioxide. So here it comes down through the pulmonary artery and the oxygen that this person just breathed in is going to cross over into that capillary and it's going to oxygenate the blood. Now what's going to leave the blood is that buildup, that carbon dioxide, and it's going to cross over into that in that alveoli sac and carbon dioxide is going to be exhaled by the person. So you have this beautiful intake of oxygen and outtake of carbon dioxide. And then the blood is going to go back through the pulmonary vein. It's going to be pumped by the heart and it's going to go throughout the body and replenish your organs, your brain, your kidneys, everything we need to function. But we have a problem with ARDS. What's happening is that this capillary membrane, which is represented here in the purple, isn't working correctly. It's starting to leak fluid from this capillary bed. So fluid's starting to leak where it shouldn't go and it can collect in this sac. So you're gonna have decreased gas exchange. And what's gonna happen is this sac will become so filled with fluid, you're gonna have a problem with that sac being able to stay open. So it's going to collapse. And we don't want our alveoli sacs to collapse because when that happens, when that person tries to take in air with oxygen in it, it's not gonna work because that sac is collapsed, it's not working. So you're gonna get a decrease in oxygen in the blood. The fancy term is hypoxemia. So you have low oxygen in the blood and what's that gonna to do to your organs? Can your brain, your kidneys, your gut, everything we need to live, work without oxygen in it? No, so organs are gonna suffer and the patient can die. So the patient, when they're in really severe ARDS, they're gonna need respiratory assistance of some kind. And usually it's like mechanical ventilation with PEEP. Positive end expiratory pressure. What, what's that gonna do? Well, that PEEP, as you're gonna learn later on in nursing interventions, is going to help open up these sacs that have collapsed, which is going to improve our gas exchange and help the patient. So first, let's talk about some quick facts about ARDS. Okay, the onset is fast. This happens suddenly. And usually, when you're gonna see this condition is in patients who are really are already hospitalized, they're there for something else. Let's say a severe burns or sepsis, which is one of the most common causes of ARDS. So they're hospitalized with another condition and they develop this. So as a nurse, you've really gotta Listen to those respiratory sounds. Look at your patient's respiratory system. And what happens is that it usually develops due to some systemic inflammation that's occurring in the body. So we know that all the blood in our body has to go through the lungs to get oxygenated. We just learned that. So if you have some type of complication going on in the body that's making that immune system send off those inflammatory cells, well, that's gonna be a lot really present in the blood. So we have sepsis somewhere. And so the blood that's going through the body normally eventually is gonna to come to the heart in this area for this gas exchange to happen so it can go back and do its job. Well, if those inflammatory cells are here in this blood, 
what's it gonna do? It can damage this capillary membrane and cause it to leak fluid. So you can have direct injury that causes ARDS or you can have indirect, which we're gonna cover those here in a moment. So be keeping that in mind. Now, the mortality rate with ARDS is relatively high. So patients who have this, this is a very serious condition, they're treated in the intensive care unit. Now let's talk about what causes that capillary membrane that surrounds alveoli sac to leak. And then we'll talk about the pathophysiology and the phases of ARDS. Okay, so any event that leads to major systemic inflammation in the body can cause this condition. And this is usually from indirect sources. So the source is not in the lungs, it's somewhere else throughout the body. And what happens is that the immune system with your inflammatory cells is producing a lot of those and of course they're in the blood. So once the blood is passing through the lungs, because we learned it has to do that, they can damage that capillary membrane causing leakage of fluid. So some conditions that can cause that are sepsis, and remember sepsis was the most common cause of ARDS, and if a patient sepsis is being caused by a gram-negative bacteria, the patient has a very poor prognosis because it's going to be really hard to treat. In addition, burns can cause us severe burns throughout the body. You have major inflammation going on with that. So you can definitely see why that can happen. In addition, blood transfusions, where they've had multiple transfusions, inflammation of the pancreas, pancreatitis, hence that inflammation going on with the pancreas, and drug overdose. Now another way a person can develop ARDS is through direct causes. So. The source is what? Our lungs. It's coming from the lungs. And it has been directly damaged, that capillary membrane. And what can cause this is like pneumonia. A patient gets pneumonia in those lungs and can damage that membrane. Aspiration, a lot of patients who have difficulty swallowing, they can aspirate food, gastric secretions, which we know that gastric secretions, what's the role of it? It digests. So if it gets inside of our delicate lungs, it can definitely damage that capillary membrane. Along with an inhalation injury, we talked in depth about that in our burn series, how inhaling any toxic substances like smoke, powders, anything like that, get in there, damage the membrane near drowning events, or some type of embolism. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of ARDS. How does this happen? Now as I go through these phases, this is the absolute worst case scenario. Not all patients will even go through these phases. Some patients recover faster than others. But if they do hit this last uh, phase, their prognosis is very poor and they're gonna have a lot of lung damage. So there's three phases. We're gonna talk about that exudative, then the proliferative, and then the fibrotic. First, let's talk about the exudative phase. Okay, this happens about 24 hours after injury. And remember, it can be direct or an indirect injury. Regardless, there's gonna be damage to that capillary membrane. So when you have damage to that membrane, fluid is going to start to leak into the sac. And that fluid is protein rich. Now what's one thing we have been talking about with protein? Protein regulates water, that oncotic pressure. So if you have this fluid that's leaking with a lot of protein in it, it's gonna draw more water to it, which isn't good. So at first this fluid is gonna enter into the interstitium, which is like that space that is in between the sac and that capillary membrane. So whenever you're listening to lung sounds in the early part of this, they may sound normal or a little bit diminished. You're not gonna start hearing abnormal lung sounds until that fluid starts going into this alveoli sac. So that's where it's gonna go after the interstitium. And then that's where this patient's going to have pulmonary edema. So you can hear those crackles with that. Now one thing with acute respiratory distress syndrome is that the physician has to determine is this ARDS or is this heart related, like heart failure, while we're getting the pulmonary edema? And we're gonna talk about it in our nursing interventions, but they will probably look at a pulmonary artery wedge pressure, and whatever that reading is can help us know, is this ARDS? So keep that in mind. In addition from 
everything that's going on, there's cells in there that produce surfactant and they're gonna become overwhelmed and become damaged. So we're gonna have decreased amounts of surfactant being produced. Now what does surfactant do? It helps decrease surface tension. So in other words, it helps the sac stay stable. So it doesn't collapse whenever a person exhales. But we're not having that with this. So what's gonna happen, you have decreased amounts of surfactant, it equals an unstable alveoli sac that's gonna collapse and they're gonna develop a condition called actelectasis. So with actelectasis, the person's not gonna be able to move that oxygen in because that sac is collapsed. So our oxygen level is going to fall, hypoxemia. Now, to make things even worse, if it couldn't get any worse, Something's gonna develop that is made up of dead cells and proteins called a hyaline membrane. And this membrane is gonna affect how the lungs work. It's going to make the lungs less elastic. So the lungs are gonna be stiff. And you're gonna have decreased lung compliance. So really how the lung can stretch and um, whenever the person breathes in and out. So what's gonna happen, you're gonna have what's called a VQ mismatch, a ventilation and perfusion mismatch, where the ventilation, the ability to ventilate isn't going to match the body's ability to perfuse. So with all this going on, the fluid buildup in the alveoli sacs, the decreased surfactant, the hyaline membrane that's developing, it's all gonna to lead to the alveoli sac collapsing, it's not gonna work. Also, you're gonna to have to see a decrease in lung compliance, which is going to throw us into a VQ mismatch. And whenever you're looking at your patient as the nurse, because of all this patho that's going on, there is a hallmark sign and symptom that you want to remember. And it's called refractory hypoxemia. So as the nurse, you can give them high amounts of oxygen, concentration of oxygen, it's not going to increase their oxygen level. And the reason is, is because what's going on? Our lung is getting stiff, our uh, sacs are collapsed, that oxygen cannot flow down through that sac to go into that capillary and replenish the body. So there's no way you can get that oxygen back up because of what's going on. So when you look at ABGs, what are you gonna see? Well, in the very early stages, in order for the body to try to compensate, it has low oxygen. So what do you think your body wants to do whenever it has low oxygen? It wants to increase your breathing. So they're gonna have an increased respiratory rate. But as we've just learned, it's not gonna help. So we're still gonna have a low O2 level. So we're breathing hard, we're breathing hard. Well, oxygen can't get in, but carbon dioxide is still crossing over. So as we're breathing out that fast breathing, what are we gonna be blowing off? Carbon dioxide. So our CO2 level will drop and blood pH level will increase. So we're gonna enter into respiratory alkalosis at first. Now, as this patient progresses to those different phases, we have the continued development of this hyaline membrane. It's gonna make it even more hard for um, CO2 to cross over. We're going to start actually increasing in our CO2 levels, along with the patient's respiratory muscles are just gonna get wore out. So you're gonna see an increase of carbon dioxide. So then they can enter into respiratory acidosis later on. The next phase is the proliferative phase. And this occurs about 14 days after injury. And just like the word proliferative, it's talking about growing and reproducing. That's what's happening in this phase. The body's trying to repair structures. So you have these cells that are being reproduced quickly to do this. And you're gonna have the resorption of that fluid that was in that sac. But here's the thing, it's not gonna be reproduced and restructured like it should be. What's gonna happen is that this lung tissue that's being created is gonna be very dense and fibrous. So you're gonna have even more decreased lung compliance and the hypoxemia is going to get worse. So after that phase, about three weeks after injury, some patients enter into the fibrotic phase. And this is where you have fibrosis of lung tissue. Doesn't work right. 
and pretty much what the patient can have is just dead space in the lungs that just doesn't work. You don't have gas exchange. So patients who do enter into this fibrotic phase are going to have major lung damage and their prognosis is very poor. And like I said at the beginning, not all patients will enter into this. This is like worst case scenario. So to help us remember all that pathophysiology we just talked about, and so you can recall this easily on a test, let's remember this mnemonic, ARDS. That's what we're talking about. So so the first, the A, is actelectasis. So let me write that up here. This is what's developing. And why was that developing? Well, we have fluid in that lung, in that alveoli sac. We have decreased surfactant cells, which is decreasing our surface tension, and our sac is collapsing. So we have that. R is for refractory hypoxemia. So the patient is developing that. And remember, that was a hallmark sign and symptom. You can give them high amounts of oxygen concentration, but it's not going to increase their, their oxygen level. And then D, they have decreased lung compliance. And we have that hyaline membrane that's starting to develop and the fibrosis of the lung tissue, decreased surfactant collapse. Sac. So our lung compliance, the ability of our lungs to stretch and fill with air is totally decreased. So our lungs are getting stiff, they're getting hard. And then the S is surfactant, is cells are going to be damaged. So you're going to have decreased surfactant, which really ties in with the collapsed lung and everything going on. So what signs and symptoms are you going to see as the nurse with this condition? Well, very early on, these signs and symptoms are going to be really barely noticeable. They're going to be very subtle. So when you listen to lung sounds, they may sound normal. You may hear like a random crackle here and there. But that's because that fluid, because that capillary membrane is damaged, the fluid's really just in the interstitium. But as it moves into that sac, that's where you're going to start seeing a lot of problems. You can start seeing difficulty breathing on the patient's part. They're going to be really air hungry because their body is saying, we need oxygen, and they're going to be wanting air. They're going to have that increased respiratory rate that we talked about, low oxygen level, their SATs are going to be low, arterial oxygen level is going to be low, and you can see respiratory alkalosis in the beginning. And then as it progresses, this pulmonary edema is getting worse and worse, and you're getting decreased lung compliance. That surfactant is gone. We have collapsed sacs all throughout the lung fields. They're going to be full-blown respiratory failure. They're going to have that refractory hypoxemia, which is that hallmark sign and symptom of ARDS, so remember that in your memory. They're going to have cyanosis. Why is that? Tissues aren't being perfused, so they're going to be blue. There's no oxygen to perfuse. Mental status changes. Tired, fatigued, confused. Why? The brain is being deprived of oxygen. Increased heart rate. That heart is stressed out from the low oxygen, so it's beating harder and faster. Chest retractions. Literally, this looks like the skin is just pulled over the ribs. You can see the ribs, and the body is just trying to get air in from where it's not getting the oxygen. You will start to hear crackles throughout, not just randomly throughout, and that's the pulmonary edema. And a chest x-ray, which can be done to look at ARDS, will have a wide out appearance to it where the patient will have bilateral infiltrates throughout the lungs. Now let's talk about some nursing interventions for patients with ARDS. So a big goal of course is maintaining that airway and respiratory function of these patients because it's significantly compromised. So a goal is to have that PaO2, which is that arterial level for oxygen, at least 60 millimeters of mercury or greater. That's where we want them and their oxygen saturation to be at least 90% or greater. So usually how that is accomplished, most patients will be on mechanical ventilation with PEEP. Again, that was positive in expiratory pressure. And the PEEP pressures are going to be high for these patients. They can be titrated anywhere between 10 to 20 centimeters of water. And it'll be titrated based on how the patient's responding, how everything looks. And why does it have to be so high? 
well. What we just learned in the patho, everything that's going on with the lungs, those lungs are collapsed. So we've got to get those open. So the reason why is there's decreased lung compliance, that elasticity of the lung, it, the ability of it to stretch, it's become stiff, so it's really not happening. In addition, there's fluid edema in those sacs, so we're working against that. And there's decreased surfactant being produced, so we don't have that surface tension being maintained. We have a very unstable sac, so we have collapse. So they need that high pressure to help open up those alveoli sacs that are collapsed, especially during exhalation. And with that pressure, our goal or end result, hopefully, will have improved gas exchange, increase that oxygen level, and keep those sacs clear of fluid. But because this pressure is so high, you have to watch out for complications related to this because it can increase intrathoracic pressure, which can compress the heart and decrease cardiac output. So you gotta watch those blood pressures. These patients are gonna have sophisticated monitoring, um, hemodynamic monitoring, you'll be looking at that. So if they do have hypotension, starts to develop that decreased cardiac output, the physician can prescribe them like colloid solutions, crystalloids, IV solutions to help with that. Also like inotropic cardiac drugs like dobutamine to help with the heart's ability to contract properly to help prevent this. In addition, the patient can develop hyperinflation of the lungs because of this high pressure that is being exerted on it. So the patient is at risk for a pneumothorax where the whole lung just can collapse. In addition to like sub -Q emphysema, be watching out for that, where air is actually escaping the lungs. There's like a hole in the lung and it's going into the tissues and you can feel it. If you've ever felt it before, it's like crunchy, um, like Rice Krispies or something just in the skin. It feels very weird. Now prone positioning, let's talk about positioning. Positioning can help with respiratory function. There's various types of positioning, but I wanna hit on the prone positioning. This is where you move them from their back to their belly, so they're actually laying on their belly. And here in nursing, that's a little bit weird putting a patient on their belly, but it's actually been shown to increase their oxygen without having to increase oxygen concentration. And why is that? Well, it helps improve ventilation and perfusion and it helps improve airflow because you no longer, if you're laying back, having the heart lay back and compressing that posterior parts of the lungs. So you're really not getting airflow whenever they're like that. But when you flip them over, you don't have the heart compressing that. Instead, it's gonna really lay up against the sternum. In addition, it's gonna help move secretions to other areas that normally couldn't be free from secretions because of the um, supine position, and it's gonna help improve that atelectasis. Another thing is that a pulmonary artery wedge pressure reading may be obtained. And this is where the physician can rule out if this is cardiac related because we have a weak heart, like heart failure, that's causing fluid to back up into the lungs. And this is why we're seeing this respiratory distress with this pulmonary edema, or it's a capillary membrane issue in this sac that's causing fluid to leak. So what this does is it measures the left arterial pressure. So a pulmonary catheter is inserted with a balloon and it's wedged in the pulmonary arterial branch. And here's the following readings. If the reading is less than 18 millimeters of mercury, it's ARDS. If it's greater than, it's a cardiac issue. So just try to remember that number. In addition, as the nurse, you wanna monitor other body systems, making sure they're being perfused right, that they're getting enough oxygen. So with renal, what are you gonna look at? You're gonna look at the urinary output. If you have really bad urinary output, those kidneys aren't working, you got a problem. How are they mental status wise? Are they confused, are they tired? Brain's not being perfused. Look at your blood pressure, heart rate. In addition, I know we talked a little bit about fluids and like dobutamine for the decreased cardiac output, but they can also be ordered corticosteroids. That's gonna be for that inflammation because what was a big reason person develops ARDS is that systemic inflammation. Corticosteroids can help decrease that inflammation. Also, antibiotics. Why would antibiotics be given? If patient has sepsis, wanna treat that infection. In addition, GI drugs can be ordered. A lot of times patients with everything that's going on, they can develop stress ulcers. So um, some drugs to help prevent that. In addition, as a nurse, you wanna be watching out because this patient is gonna be able to move. They can have a lot of 
they're at risk for pressure injuries, pressure ulcers. So watch out for that. So when you're thinking about your plan of care, you want to include that. They're at risk for uh, ventilator acquired infections. Being on the ventilator puts them at major risk for that. And nutrition problems. They can't eat. So you want to watch those weights, those electrolytes, and make sure they're getting proper nutrition. Okay, so that wraps up this lecture over ARDS. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.